Hello, it's Ren Presents Time. I'm your host, Ren, and today we continue with the House of Bloodstein, Mentralysis, Part 2, Chapter 7, The Mystery Library. Last week, Kay and Leka arrive at Castle Blanchfort, found the place mostly empty with a few staff and a few Jones running around. The Jones have hypnotized the staff to attack if they see Kay and presumably Sarah and maybe any Blanchford who shows up and they have knives that have been malik You know, a Malik can do anything. In this case, a Malik has been set to knock you out very fast and then who knows what would happen to you. Kay and Leka enabled the old Bobby system, which is basically like a telephone system and were able to get a link with Sarah and Sarah told them she got most of the staff out by offering them a a trip to Burn, which is a city to the southwest, actually southeast, all paid for by the hospitalers there on Hoban, very nice of Sarah. So the place is mostly empty, and now they are on their way to the Mystery Library to investigate this strange statue of presumably a goddess that they had originally seen in God's Temple in the previous Bloodstein's book. And now it's there in Sarah's library, and they're going to investigate to see what's up. Because on their quest for Queen Gome, they, first of all, have no idea where she is, how to capture her, and where these crazy artifacts are located that they're seeking the necklace and headset of V Helm of Lamb. No clue. No clue. This is just a wild hunch and speculation that maybe this goddess who's carrying a, a large book might, might have some info for them to go on. So we'll see in this chapter as we go forward. One thing before I start, I've mentioned in the past... I have several literary mentors that I read feverishly and whose work I admired and whose methods, conventions, uh, mannerisms in telling a story I incorporate into my own method. I know the way I conduct a story is similar to these authors. Uh, Ursula Le Guin is one, although she's much more hard sci-fi than I am, but still the same thought that she puts in, I, I try to put in. It might not show up, I might not succeed, but I try. Another is Fritz Lieber. As far as world building, I always, I found Fritz Lieber's stories tough to read sometimes, but I loved the world that he created and the city of Lankmar just loved it loved it and I could feel the the grit in the streets and the fog in the air and the sense of burning braziers and a sense of adventure around every corner that's what I try to duplicate in the settings that I that I write about in my world I want those same feelings and then Michael Moorcock writer of the Eternal Champion series Elric Prince Coram, Hawk Moon, you name it. The audacity in which he tells a story, just the very over-the-top nature of the characters, and the, especially the villains, always very interesting, very well-thought-out villains. And just the, the manner he composes a battle and generally just conducts a story, I, I try to incorporate into the way I tell a story. And I think I replicate that well. One thing that he does, I take exception with, and we're, we're going to examine that in this chapter and in the next one, is, and he, and Moorcock does this a lot. He, it, does, it doesn't really matter what hero he's writing about. Could be Elric, could be any of the manifestations of the eternal champion. He loves to stick his hero and usually they always have a companion, uh, one companion who hangs out with them. The the hero and the companion up against an entire army. A lot of times Elric and his companion win two people up against a horde of hundreds, maybe even thousands. Usually if it's, it depends on who the, who the hero is. If it's Elric, he calls in a favor from some god or demon who owes him one. And apparently there are a lot of gods and demons who owe Elric big time and then they show up do their thing 
the army he's up against is decimated in some horrific fashion and then they mop up again and again it happens way too many times even me as a fervent fan an avid reader of Moorcock even I had to roll my eyes and go come on if and I, I made this pledge a long time ago if I ever write down some of these crazy ideas in my head and I have the hero and a companion going up against a far-flung well-equipped well-trained force they're gonna get their asses kicked that's just all there is to it two people are not going to be an entire army. I don't care if you got, you know, Brie Larson as Captain Marvel killing every man in sight. It's not going to happen. Sorry, Brie, you suck. Welcome to YouTube, by the way, and your instant monetization, your instant, instant trending, instant 2 million followers or whatever you got. Welcome to YouTube. Hurrah. Anyways... It's just not going to happen. And we're going to explore that in this chapter. And we're going to see what happens when you have two people. No matter how tough, no matter how super powered they are, which they are in my universe. And they're going to get up against basically normal people. But normal people who have them outnumbered and who have them out flanked and who have them out equipped let's see what happens so let's begin shall we part two chapter seven the mystery library as nobody was around they took a lift up through the levels passing the one sarah frequented until the doors opened on the 50th floor. Awaiting them was a small, clean vestibule, and then a set of double doors leading into the mystery library, Sarah's beloved bastion in the castle. The ceiling was a bit low, and Leica had to stoop, which she did without complaint. Kay pointed at the doors to the library. In here, Sarah says she saw a statue holding a book. The statue came from God's temple on Xandar. So we're keen to see the book it's holding and what's in it. The goddess might have favored us. The book might contain a clue on how we should proceed. This is a room we used to hang out in as kids. We still use it as a convenient gathering place. This might lead to nothing, but we'll check it out anyway. Kay passed through the doors into the fresh, natural light of the library. Leica hesitated and remained in the stony vestibule. Come on, Leica, he said. She shook her head. Enchanted. What's enchanted? Library enchanted. No, it isn't. Come on. Leica refused. She backed away toward the lift. Oh, come on, you big baby. There's nothing here to... Leica reacted as if she had been punched. Her face turned a flush shade of red, and she huddled up and began weeping. What's wrong? Kay asked, emerging through the doorway. She spoke through her hands. Leica! Leica disgrace! Leica coward! No, you're not. D did I hurt your feelings just now, calling you a big baby? She continued to sob. Kay wasn't quite sure what to do. Uh, a sobbing Hightath with hurt feelings? He hadn't imagined such a thing was possible. Hey, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. Come on, you're a ten foot tall giant. You can fly a Venera ship and you're a lot stronger than I am. And you remember everything you see or hear. I can't do any of that. Leica continued to cry. He tried to appeal to things she might like. After we investigate the library, we'll go out to the grove and find some muddy ground, drop our weapons, and have a good old-fashioned mud match. You, you and me. She looked up. Jarokod wishes to wrestle with Leica? Sure do. And I'm going to kick your butt. She seemed to cheer a little. Leica promises to wrestle well. I'm sure you will. So look, I need you here with me. That seemed to get her full attention. Charles Khan needs Leica? She asked, eyes puffy but hopeful. Of course I do. Now please stop crying. She seemed to be in need of a hug, and Kay gave her one. He felt her six arms coming around him, pulling him in close, suffocating him a little. Are you feeling better? She nodded. Okay, now tell me, why do you think the mystery library is enchanted? Leica let him go and pointed at the doorway. Leica feels energy. Enchantments. 
Very strong. Kay studied the library. Through the doorway, he could see the usual open space, the crushed green carpeting, and the assortment of stuffed chairs and mismatched couches arranged along the walls. Interspersed with broad windows admitting cheery daylight, seemed like it always did, going back to when he was a child. The only things missing were the odd, colorful posters Sarah used to have hanging on the walls, but had taken down as her tastes matured. He recalled something that Carahill once told him, that the library was one of his little temples, and that Sarah was one of his high priestesses. Carahill had said he kept things in the library, things he wanted to keep safe. Kay didn't take any note of it. He thought it was simply exaggeration or hyperbole. But maybe Carrie Hill wasn't exaggerating. Maybe the mystery library was a temple of some sort and Leica had detected its hidden power. Next to the doorway was Sarah's beloved slate indicating who was welcome to enter and who was not. According to Sarah, anybody not listed or on the forbidden side was not allowed to enter. She was very particular about it. Leica's name was not there on either side. Kay decided to appeal to Leica's sense of logic. Leica, I think maybe you're correct. Perhaps... This library is enchanted. This slate here determines who is allowed to enter and who is not. This is Sarah's library, so if we can get Sarah to add your name to the list, you should be able to enter without fear. Does that sound reasonable? She nodded and gazed at the doorway. He headed into the library. There's a bobby receiver in here. I'll ask Sarah to grant me permission to add your name. Wait right here. We're going to take care of this. Leika seated herself and tucked her knees up into her chest. Kay moved into the room. He always marveled how neat and organized it was. The eastern end of the library contained the tables and chairs, a hollow terminal, and a few coolers Sarah kept full of snacks. It saved them from having to run down to the kitchens far below. In the center of the room was a great Nadine wood table that his father, Lord Davidge, had given to Sarah. It was a relic of old Castle Durst, and he liked seeing it still in use. So he gave it to Sarah to keep in trust. Sarah took meticulous care of the table, dusting it off and intending to the wood with various oils. A set of old wooden coasters adorned with Sarah's Blanchford coat of arms sat in their box and were required to be used when beverages were introduced. He recalled the innumerable times he had sat at the table with Sarah and Philip, her eyes dreamy, discussing their next adventure. Beyond the Durst table was a small maze of bookshelves and cabinets full of books, papers, documents, and artifacts Sarah had collected over the years, and the collection was impressively enormous. Sarah had a precise knowledge of every item stored in the library, down to the smallest crinkled paper and hand-scrawled note. Though Sarah fancied herself an adventurer, fighter, and swordsman supreme, librarian was clearly her true calling, and this amazing, well-organized, and maintained space was proof of it. He wandered into the shelving, taking the twists and turns, smelling the old pages and leather-bound covers lingering in the air. Sarah's layout of the shelving made maximum use of the limited space. The tangle of shelving went on and on. Kay had forgotten or didn't realize how many books Sarah had. There had to be 10,000 books shelved here, and Sarah had probably read each and every one front to back at least once, if not more times. He reached a long corridor that went on for quite a ways. He had no memory of that corridor. The corridor seemed too open and far too long to fit in the space of circular Zyodal Tower. Down the corridor, about 300 yards, was a tan, unpainted statue of a tall female in a gown, a pair of overlarge goggles on her face. It was the statue from God's Temple on Xandar. Sarah had shown him previously and the security cameras. The statue was oddly placed. It wasn't situated in an alcove or some other out-of-the-way spot where a statue might logically go. It was plunked square in the center of the corridor. It was as if a passing lady walking down the corridor had simply turned a stone where she stood. In her thin arms, she carried a rather thick book. 
That was their objective, to get the book, and Kay decided to simply go and grab it. He cloaked himself, just in case who knows what might be waiting for him, and wafted down the corridor, amazed by its size and length. He arrived at the statue. The statue was situated in the center of a drafty crossroads. A parallel corridor cut left and right, with either end going off a long way. Too long. None of this would fit in Ziodal Tower. Therefore, this corridor had to be some sort of arcane portal going to who knows where. Leica and Carahill were correct. The arcane was at work in the mystery library. To the left, the corridor extended into a dark, yawning sort of space. A chill wave of humidity issued from it. He thought he saw bits of stone and tangled wire and something else. Something was down there, hiding in the dark, watching him. Something angry. The demon. Christina had said there was a demon in the castle. Was a demon hiding in the dark? Kay could feel it. Something small but intense and foreboding waited for him down that passage. He wanted to avoid the dark space if he could. The statue before him was familiar. He had seen it before on Xandar in God's Temple. They had gone there to gather one of Wilhella Corman Grand's Perlamum pieces and, if possible, to curry favor of the gods. They had hoped to commune with Carahill, a god they knew well, but were unsuccessful in reaching him. This particular statue of a girl wearing a gown and a pair of goggles, presumably a goddess, seemed to have taken notice of them, and it followed them about the temple, blocking their passage and following them as they exited. And here she was again, in an arcane node of the mystery library, holding a book that might have information that could assist them. He tried to take the book and head back out and get Leica. The book wouldn't budge from her hand. It was impossibly heavy. Kay's strength level certainly was nothing like his father's. He would need Leica to lift it. He headed back into the more familiar area of the mystery library. He was glad to be gone from the dark room to the left and the demon that might be hiding in it. He dropped his cloak. There was a bobby box mounted on the floor covered up with a Carahill plush toy. He moved the toy aside and pulled the receiver out. A scratchy voice filled his ear. Joe's Pizza! Pardon? Who is this, please? Kay asked, tentatively holding the receiver. He heard laughing. Oh, creation, Kay. It's me. Who else? Came Sarah's voice. Don't be so wet. We're here at the mystery library. Leica refuses to enter. She says it's enchanted. Enchanted? I stumbled into an arcane corridor in the back of the library, so maybe she's correct. In order to humor her, I would like you to grant me permission to add her name to the welcome side of the slate. A bloody high tath in my library? No way! She can wait outside in the vestibule. Sarah, we don't have time to bat this around, okay? I need her help, so lighten up. I'll make sure she doesn't get into anything or break your stuff. She's not a dog, you know. She hasn't broken anything yet. You promise? Yes. Yes, I promise. Okay, but it's going to be you and me doing a couple of rounds in the grove if I find anything messed up once I get back. You might have to get past my new Hightath bodyguard for that. I think me and the Hightath are going to be doing some rounds regardless. So after we settle up, I'll be coming for you. Just make sure she doesn't break stuff or remove anything from its proper place, okay? I promise. So here we go. I, Sarah of Blanchford, daughter of Lady Poe and Lord Peter of Ruthven, grant unto Cable, Lord of Blanchford, son of Lord Davidge and Countess Sigillis of Blanchford, the temporary right to annotate the official welcoming slate of the fabulous mystery library in any manner he sees fit. Good until I set foot in the library proper once more, at which time the privilege shall be revoked. There. That ought to do it. Thanks. I saw the statue. The book's there. Did you take it? No. Why didn't you take the book if you saw it? It's too heavy for me to lift. I need Leica. Oh, creation... You're a wimp, Kay. Well, hurry it up. I want to know what's in it. All right. Let's hope this bears fruit. 
Kay hung up the receiver and went to the entrance of the library. He could see Leica huddled up by the doorway, solemnly peeking in. He found a marker and went back into the vestibule. I just spoke to Sarah and she granted me permission to make changes to the slate. He showed her the marker. See this? I'm going to add your name to the welcome side and then you will be able to enter without fear. Will that be sufficient? She nodded. I saw the book while I was in there. I'll need you to lift it. It's way heavy. Kay wrote her name onto the welcome side of the slate. There. All set. Come on in. Leka lipped her lips and stepped in. Nothing happened. She stood it just inside the doorway and waited for him to follow. As Kay put the slate back on the wall, he noticed there were several new entries on the welcome side that hadn't been there previously. The Jones was one, and Tauderoga was another, all in Sarah's distinctive hand. Sarah must have added them while under hypnosis. If that was the case, then the Jones had already been in the library, and the notion that they were waiting inside to spring a trap seemed a distinct possibility. Had he not been cloaked, they might have attacked. He struggled with the idea. Enemies in the mystery library, their childhood play area, the safest place in the world. Just for good measure, Kay scratched their names off the list and added them to the forbidden side. He then placed the slate back on the wall. There was an explosion of noise within the library. Jarlcon! came Leica's voice in a scream. Kay rushed inside. A strange tempest had appeared inside the library, throwing the place into a chaos of smoke and cloud. Fierce winds whipped through Leica's hair. Through the torrent, Kay saw several people come tumbling out of the maze of shelves like man-shaped pieces of paper caught in a fierce wind. White shirts, fancy cloaks, fluttering dramatically, mixed into the tempest were a number of long tubular objects shattering, spinning in chaos. The Jones, and they had been armed with sniper rifles, as he suspected, an ambush. Kay counted 12 people and their weapons and various kit go spinning by, tumbling head over heel past the durst table and out the doors where they clattered into the vestibule like toppled bowling pins. The torrent ceased. Kay led Leica by the hand into the shelves where they took cover. The cloaks back up. They can't see us, he said as she drew her lag pistols and cocked them. We fight, she cried. We wait. Just wait. Through the door, Kay saw the Jones picking themselves up, milling about in confusion, some injured, some holding their heads in pain. One of them tried to re-enter the library and was violently rebuffed, sent flying back toward the lift. The enchantment on the library was potent and proved real. After a moment, one Jones, a thin young man with short blonde hair, approached the doorway, leaned down and examined the slate. He took his time, carefully reading the names printed there. He smiled and said a few things to his fellows. They retreated to the back of the vestibule. Hello, he said, standing in the doorway. Lord Blanchford, is that you? Leica took aim. Leica, no, Kay cried, but too late. The lag discharged in a gritty cloud of burnt powder and gun smoke. In Kay's dark sight, he could see the twisting condensation trail of the bullet as it sizzled through the air towards the man's head with a fast twist. In a nonchalant manner, the young man standing at the doorway reached up and plucked the high-caliber bullet out of the air like it was no big deal and let it fall to the floor in a harmless roll. The young man spoke again. I say, that was certainly wasn't very sporting, was it? A moment of silence passed as he awaited an answer. Kay partially let his cloak drop and spoke. And what you did to me and my kin without provocation, was that sporting? Was waiting for me in ambush in this tower sporting? The young man gave a short laugh. I suppose not. Well then, we'll call it even for the time being, shall we? I must say, I've visited quite a number of fancy Canaan households of late, and I'm certain I like this one most of all. Most impressive. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Tal Daroga. I'm certain you've heard my name before. Kay bristled. Indeed I have. And how is Rawl these days? Tal asked. Xenons, especially ones from Hoban, are so... St 
dodgy, aren't they? I'm not interested in engaging in a session of false civility with you, sir, Kay shot back. Ah, how vith you are. Perhaps you'd like to discuss with me how it is your leader is currently wearing my wife's face, holding her teacup with my wife's hands, walking to the bank to steal our money on my wife's feet, and so on. I am most keen to discover how that process works. Tauderoga laughed and shook his head. Yes, I'm certain. Just business is all. Your pardon. I'm not accustomed to dealing with someone whose position is so at odds with my own. I'm accustomed to a bit of tacit civility. Ah, you're in the service of a tyrant and a thief and a liar, and you may count me as your mortal enemy. Let's be clear on that point, Kay said with fury. Acknowledged. And that's a great shame, for I'm not a bad person, and I'm certain you aren't one either. Fate, it seems has pitted us against each other. Fate had nothing to do with it, sir. When your master chose to come at my wife, assault her, steal her goods, discard her for dead, invade my home, that is when we became enemies. Taldoroga raised his hands and let them fall. I understand how you feel. I, I truly do. What can I say? Guilty as charged. My mistress fancied your wife's face and that's all there was to it. You should take that as a compliment. I must say I find the candor of this situation unique and uncomfortable. I suppose a more stealthy theft and murder, free from that awkward moment when you have to face those you have wronged, is more to your liking. You must understand, I'm not cruel or evil. I do not sit in my home or in our sacred places and dream of doing evil things. None of us do. We're not Zaffins. Fine words. Zaffins, at least, do not attempt to rationalize away their misconduct. I have never been so wronged by a Zaffin. Tao's voice took on a hard edge. Truly, wounded and suitably enraged, are you? From my perspective, you, sir, are standing in the way of progress of making a better day for the League, we are pledged to serve humanity. Understand? He gestured, his hands cutting through the air, driving home his points. In order to do that, we must increase our knowledge. Bella Thouser is within our grasp at long last. With Bella Thouser, our knowledge of the human analog will be complete. Nothing will be left to chance. There will be no questions for which we will not have an instant answer. Imagine it! It will be a new age of man, a revolution of thought and of cure, with lowly baths at its center. And meanwhile, you bow in fealty to a creature wearing my beloved wife's face. A creature who will lead us to Bella Thouser, Tal Daroga shouted. What is a life, or two, in the service of man? One life and millions more. Yes, and millions after that. All nameless dead in the service of total knowledge. An acceptable loss, and we are willing to pay it. Kay fully dropped his cloak and stepped out into plain sight. Of all those nameless dead, one of them indeed has a name, for it is Lady Sammy Doran of Blanchford, and it is also vengeance. He brandished his card. Tao waved his hands and snapped his fingers. Kay fell into an immediate trance and stood erect like a statue. Tao Daroga laughed. <laughs> ah, the vith, he said in a suddenly calm voice. So dramatic and easily stirred. He turned to his fellow Jones. He's ready. He turned back to Kay. Come here, Lord Blanchford. You've some documents to sign, some funds to transfer, and I are certain there are more coffers in this castle to empty we just haven't found yet. You shall lead us to them. Living in a mortal life is expensive. I'm certain you understand. You wanted to see our leader, and we shall take you to her, make no mistake. All this house has, including your blood and the hearts that pump it, belongs to my mistress. And then you are going to die, all in the name of progress. Come on, come to me. He gestured for Kay to come to him. Entranced, Kay moved towards the door. Leka came thundering out from behind the shelves, blasting away with her lags shooting over Katie's head. Daroga caught one bullet and dove aside as more shots whistled in, picking up cones of pulverized stone as they hit the wall. 
I death! De Roger cried. The Jones moved about in the vestibule in confusion as she maintained her fire. With two free hands, she picked Kay up and ran back into the shelf and took him cover. She set him down and shook him. Jarl Khan, she asked, probing him with her hands. Jarl Khan bewitched! Kay, eyes glazed, roused from his trance a little. Slap me, he whispered. What? She asked. She brought her ear down to his mouth to listen. Speak again. Slap me, Leka. Kay repeated, and without hesitation or pause, Leka slapped him in the face nearly hard enough to sever his head from his neck. Kay jostled on the verge of unconsciousness for a moment. Leka raised her hand to slap him again. No, no, I'm, I'm all right, he stammered. Another slap might kill him. He lolled about, trying to gather his wits. Leka hovered over him, her eyes wide. I'm fine. Give me a moment. From the doorway came Tal Daroga's voice again. We're prepared to negotiate. We're not unreasonable. You cannot have your wife's accessories back, nor any of the others we've taken, for those have already been promised. And neither shall you yourself be spared. I'm sorry. There it is. However, think of your staff and the rest of your family and the continuation of your house. Think of all those things. They are on the negotiating table as of this moment. Perhaps we won't have to make your staff have illegal sex with each other, or fight or kill or devour one another. Perhaps they can be safe and unharmed, weeping before your empty grave, remembering you as a fine lord and a kind benefactor. Perhaps we shall not need to lie and wait for your parents and siblings to return to the League and welcome them with force of arms. Perhaps we not need to pay a visit to your aunt and Esther. Such is in my power to argue their case before my master. Think of that. Kay felt his wits returning by the moment as he listened to Tal Daroga. Hearing nothing, Daroga continued, Very well. You force me to take grotesque measures. Activity at the doorway caught Kay's attention. The Jones bustled about in the vestibule. From the lift, they hauled in a large cryo chest on floats. The Jones were setting up a temporary command post in the vestibule, very organized, very Hospitower-like in their methods. They were also girding themselves for battle, trucking in an arsenal from the lift, donning war gloves armed with man-to-man -man rockets, huge D4 trembly gas guns, and gangly battle armor suits, all weapons and systems meant to take down very large, very powerful quarry. In this case, it was clear they were kidding out to hunt and kill Leka as if they were on safari. Where was all this gear coming from, Kay wondered. The castle had been empty save for a few sentinels only a short time ago he focused on them and ran his sight back there they were docked in the village and four merkaba class transport ships each loaded for war and teeming with jones clearly they had been waiting hoping he would return to the castle and now here they were powered up in a raid for battle. Kay was thankful that Sarah had managed to get most of the staff out of the castle. That was one less thing to worry about. They presented the floating cryo chest to Tal Daroga. He opened it, bloated, heavy cryo mist came out and trailed down to the floor, lingering there like swamp fog. He reached into the smoking interior and pulled out what looked like a delicate human hand and wrist. Rounded off and smooth at the nub, like a hand gently removed from a marble statue. Kay quickly ran his sight back through time, seeing the hand bathed in water, sprinkled with dust, and then attached to a female arm. Sarah's hand. That was Sarah's disembodied hand Daroga was holding. Tal Daroga selected a small device from the chest. The device was squared off and functional, sporting a flexible cable studded with a thick gauge needle. He stretched the cable out and inserted the needle into the base of the hand's wrist. The fingers came to life, moving with a spidery, machine-like beat. Daroga fine-tuned the device and the fingers came under full control. He presented the hand with the mark and placed it into its grasp, the fingers positioning it to write. He was going to use Sarah's disembodied hand to write on the slate and grant himself admittance. As it would be Sarah's hand doing the writing, the enchantment conditions protecting the library would most likely be met and disarmed. The Jones would then surge in, 
Hunt and subdue him. Hunt and then kill Leica. Kay sighted the chest. Inside was a menagerie of disembodied parts, hands, feet, breasts, male and female genitalia, and a series of faces. Sarah's, Kai's, and those of several staff members. And there was a little boy's face there too. Sebastian, Kai's son. Inside this chest was a frozen treasure trove of their stolen parts, all stored and collected for safekeeping. How arrogant the Jones, believing themselves to be in complete command of this situation, had brought this wondrous cachet of stolen booty into his presence, unmindful of the possibility of a counterattack. That was a grave miscalculation. That chest contained the prizes his loved ones so desperately needed, and he was going to have it back at all costs. He had recently told Leica that he preferred to fight only when he had to, that with modesty and decorum dictated his usual routine. If ever a moment called for violent action and a display of power, it was this one. That chest was going to be his, and the Jones were going to suffer in its taking. Kay cloaked himself and wafted out into the vestibule where the Jones were readying themselves for battle with Leica. A nearby Jones in a black battle suit had nearly finished powering up his unit as supercooled fuel was pumped in. The suit was a gangly, servo-driven metal framework that fit around his body and mimicked his movements with cold fusion power. A good battle unit rig would allow him to punch through a stone wall and mangle steel. Kay wasted no time and showed no mercy. He took the operator's head off with a swing of his card. He's here! Someone shouted. Tao, he's here! A moment later, another Jones was dead. Headless. Tao Daroga was at sensed at seeing his people fall. Missed him already! And remember, we need him alive! He held Sarah's hand in his shaking fist. One of the Jones tossed an egg-shaped device to the floor. It cracked open and red grainy mist filled the vestibule. Laser light from the battle units panned about and Kay's cloaked body lit up plain as day in a red silhouette. He's there, a Jones cried. Kay wafted to the other side of the vestibule. Tauderoga had already proved he could hypnotize him into a trance in mere seconds. Kay had to keep moving, avoid eye contact, and keep the Jones guessing. He wafted in front of a Jones wearing a pair of man-to-man -man rocket gloves. He took off the Jones' left leg at the kneecap. The person fell and screamed, gushing blood, creating chaos and confusion, and wounded to be tended. Kay chopped through their terminals and screens. He severed their exposed fuel lines. Fire, sparks, and dense mist from the spewing super-cold fuel turned the vestibule into a no-man's land of the dead and the dying. Lock him up, they cried. He won't hold still. They attempted to move into a semblance of a battle front. However, they were encumbered with heavy weaponry designed to slay large quarry far too slow to properly engage a fast wafter. One after another went down, cloven through arms, legs, gut pierced and hamstrung. Moans and screams for help from the distressed Jones mingled in a horrid chorus. K fought his way to Tauderoga. Boom! K wafted behind him, but Daroga, unarmed, punching light and fast with incredible skill, was all over him. He even hit K with Sarah's balled up hand. K tried to use his card, but Daroga crowded into him, stilling his arm. K had no room to use his weapon. Look at me, Blanchford! Daroga demanded, slathering. Look at me! More punches, fast and savage. Sarah's hand went to his throat. Fighting unarmed was not Kay's strong suit, and he was badly outclassed. He felt himself being beaten unconscious. He tried to waft away, but he couldn't concentrate. Daroga's fellows were closing in. Kay tried one last ploy. He bull rushed Daroga and forced him through the doorway of the library. Almost instantly, Daroga was spat back out with mystical fury. He flew through the doorway like a cannonball, plowing into the Jones, Sarah's hand lying next to him like a spider, fingers twitching. Kay, staggering, collected the cryo chest and pulled it through the safety of the library. Blanchfort! Get back out here, you cowardly shine pole! He heard Daroga roar from the vestibule. Kay twisted and turned into the maze of shelves, taking his prize with him, though Sarah's hand remained with the Jones. And with that, we conclude part two, chapter seven, the mystery library.
And I wasn't kidding at the in the pre-matter when I mentioned that when T got two people fighting a big force that's pretty well equipped, pretty well trained, they're probably going to lose. We haven't even gotten into the main fight with the Jones yet. They're still getting ready. They're still getting their their shit ready to go to take him down. And he had the element of surprise. And he had a confined area. And he had wounded that he created that would create issues for the Jones. He killed quite a few of them, but even still, they, they still maintained their composure, were able to see through his cloak. Tal Daroga, who apparently can catch bullets, I don't know who put that in there, but it, he can catch bullets right out of the air. Beat the crap out of him, unarmed, almost beat him unconscious, whole, while he's holding Sarah's disembodied hand, which was kind of a creepy touch, I thought. Though they have a, they, they brought in a chest full of all their parts. It was like a treasure trove and Kay was determined to get it. And he managed to get it and take it into the library. All except for Sarah's hand which was still out there with the Jones. That was, uh, that was fun. And we're just getting started with this fight. Next chapter is when things really go down. And then we'll see how Kay and Leica manage to survive against the, all these Jones. Once they're really ready to go, once they're, they're fully formed and got all their equipment going, we'll see what happens. Hope I haven't given nothing away. Anywho, that will be next week where we read Part 2, Chapter 8, H. Grenadiers. And we will conclude this battle inside the Mystery Library at that time. Until then, this is Ren Presents. I'm your host, Ren. Oh, before I say peace out, Brie Larson, no hard feelings about YouTube and monetization and trending and privilege and instant fame, instant followers uh, in your heavily produced non-inclusive echo chamber of a YouTube channel. Peace out. Ta.